baby on the deals, Nick. So this is the, the second lecture we're going to have on distributed OHP systems. Um, so remember I said that the, the it was originally uh, slated to be one lecture, and then I split up to two. And then on Wednesday, we'll discuss the distributed OLAP or analytical systems. And then we'll sprinkle in a discussion about uh, cloud environments or cloud databases in, in that lecture. So uh, the things that you have coming up in the semester to finish up. Uh, so next Monday in this room, we'll have uh, one of the engineers, lead engineer from VoltDB, come give a talk about their distributed in-memory database system. And that'll be a nice sort of uh, a nice way to end the semester because they'll talk about the things that we talked about through the entire semester. Um, they'll also talk about being an in-memory database system. So if you're taking the advanced class next semester, that'll be a nice segue into that material. But it'll also be, it's all, VoltDB is also a distributed database system. So it'll discuss a lot of the things that we'll, we're talking about from this class and last class as well. And then uh, on the, the last day of class, we'll have the final review in class. I'll, uh, and then I'll do the, the system potpourri. So if you haven't yet, go online and vote for uh, what, your, what database system you want to learn about. And I'll come spend 10, 15 minutes at, uh, to, to teach it, to sort of crash course on it. I haven't looked to see who's, who's currently, currently winning. Um, and then I'll post this on Piazza as well. We'll do an extra credit check. Uh, some of you have gotten started. There was a bug in the, in the system I fixed yesterday on the website. Um, but if you, if, you've been, if you want me to look at your assignment before you turn it in, try to get full credit, uh, I'll set up a way to do that uh, next week, OK? And I'll just send you email with the feedback of like, this doesn't look right, this, this looks right, what about this, what about that, stuff like that. The uh, remaining database talks we have this semester, um, again, so in class we'll have the VoltDB talk on, on Monday, but also that same Monday in the afternoon, uh, they'll give a more researchy talk in the database group meeting at, at 4.30 in, in the Gates building. But then this Thursday we have a, uh, the, the founder of a uh, German da database hardware accelerator company uh, is coming to give a, uh, the final lecture in our seminar series on hardware accelerated databases. So Swarm64 is an FPGA that does query acceleration. So think of all the things that we talked about in the class today, or class this semester, how to do predicates, how to do joins, and things like that. They can actually push that in hardware to speed things up. So it's, it's, the idea itself is not new, but they're like a new startup that's actually trying to, trying to, trying to build one of these things. So that, that should be interesting, OK? All right. The, the last class, we, when we were discussing distributed OTP systems, we covered sort of three main topics. Uh, the system architecture was how the, the, we were going to organize a distributed system on the nodes in terms of what is of local to each node, whether they have a local disk, local memory, uh, or whether they have, um, they're sharing a disk across the entire, entire fleet or cluster machines. And now we're going to coordinate all, all of that together. Right? Shared memory, shared disk, shared nothing. Then we talked about how to do partitioning, also known as sharding in the NoSQL world. And we talked about how to do hash partitioning, where you basically just take the, you pick one or more attributes or columns, you take the values of every single tuple, you hash them, then you assign them to a partition. You're, sort of, you're breaking up the, uh, a single giant database into individual pieces on different nodes. Now, logically, it looks like a single global database, but underneath the covers physically, it's been broken up. And then we finish off talking about how to do transaction coordination. And the, the, main, uh, the main two choices we have for this are to do a centralized model or decentralized model. All right, centralized models where everyone's going through some kind of uh, middleware or a coordinator that's in char charge of figuring out whether transactions are allowed to commit or acquire locks on different, the different nodes in our cluster. And then a decentralized model is one where the nodes sort of figure out things on their own. So it just roughly sort of looks like this in, in the decentralized model. All right, I'm going to show this because this is what we're going to focus on, on today for the most part. But the, the things we'll talk about actually can be applied also to a centralized model. But I think it's easier to think about in a decentralized one. <laughs> We have an application server. It wants to access data at these three partitions. So it's going to pick one of these partitions to be the, the base partition or the coordinating partition, the home partition. Right, this is, this is the, the node that's going to be responsible for the execution lifetime of this transaction. So we go to the first node and we say, hey, we want to start a transaction. Once we get the acknowledgment that, that we're ready to go, then the, the application server can send whatever query request that it wants to the different partitions to do whatever it wants. And then when it wants to go ahead and commit, it sends a commit request to its base partition. 
And then this base partition is responsible for communicating with the other nodes that it knows is involved in the, in the transaction to say, hey, is this transaction allowed to commit? So last class, this last step here, safe to commit, is what I was super vague about. And that's what we're going to talk about mostly today. Right? We need a way to ensure that if our transaction goes ahead and says, hey, we want to commit, that we got to go ask everybody else that was involved in that transaction or could see the effects of that transaction, is that transaction allowed to commit? And we need a way to make sure that they all agree that we're going to commit. And then once we agree, we, we never fall back and have a, you know, a weird re reversal of that change. So when everything works, you know, when everything's super fast or all your connections are, are, are reliable, this is not that hard. It's when now, now you're in a distributed environment, when the, the network is a, another resource you have to account for in your protocols, then this is when, when this coordination becomes tricky. Right? Because what happens if a node fails when we're trying to go ahead and commit? Right? Or what happens if our message is that we want to send, hey, is it safe to commit this? What if one shows up before the other or things show up late? Right? Furthermore, what happens if we don't actually wait for all the nodes to agree that it's okay to save, save, is, is it safe to commit this transaction? Right? Some systems will actually let you do that. What are, the, what, what are the implications of this? So this is what we're going to focus on today. We're going to focus on atomic commit protocols. Again, that's the, the method we use to, to get everyone to agree that it's okay to commit a transaction or, or we need to roll back. Then we'll talk about replicated environments. And this is going to be how we're going to uh, make basically copies of the pieces of data on different machines or different nodes. And then we'll talk about consistency issues with the CAP theorem. And then we'll finish up talking about federated databases. So I realize that I'm going through this very quickly. And I'm also going through this at, at a bit of a high level. Uh, like we're trying to condense down in three lectures what could be an entire year on distributed databases. And the idea here is not that I'm going to teach you everything you need to know so that you can go off and build your own distributed database. It's more like I feel like my job is to expose you to the concepts and issues and, and difficulties of distributed databases so that if you're ever in, out in the real world and you think you want to build a distributed database or you think you want to use one, you at least know what are the issues you should be thinking about. right? So there's no distributed database course at CMU, just because I'm the only sort of database systems person here. Uh, so this is the, this is the, the best you're going to get, OK? <laughs> but again, again the, as I said last class, everything we talked about up to, up to this point in the semester, when we were talking about single node systems, is still applicable here. Right? You still have upper poles. You still have indexes. You still have transactions. All that crap still matters here, which is now we're doing a distributed environment. But now getting everyone to agree whether it's OK to commit transaction, that's the hard part we're adding onto this. OK, so the atomic commit protocol is what a distributed database is going to use when we have a transaction that spans multiple nodes to get them to agree that it's allowed to commit a transaction. Because right? what we don't want to happen is we don't want to have, you know, we're involved in three nodes. One guy says, yes, we want to commit this. The other two say, we don't want to commit this. And for some weird reason, we decide to commit this. That puts us in a, in a, in a bad state, right? We, we would be we would, uh, hurting the integrity of, of the database because the transaction shouldn't have committed, but for some reason we committed it. So if you've taken a distributed computing course, they're gonna, they're, in, in their parlance, they're going to call, the, call this a consensus protocol. In databases, this is usually re referred to as an atomic commit protocol. It's essentially, it is the same thing, OK? So there's a bunch of different algorithms or protocols you can use to, to do, get this atomic commit property across in a distributed setting. The most famous one is probably two-phase commit, and that's what we're going to focus on here, and that's what most database system, distributed databases actually implement. There's actually a three-phase commit from the 1980s that was invented by Mike Stonebreaker, the guy that invented Postgres. Um, nobody actually ever uses this, right? It's, it's too slow. The other one you may be familiar with or heard of before is Paxos. Paxos is a, um, the way you think about this is between two-phase commit and Paxos. Two-phase commit is a, is, a, is a subset of Paxos, right? They're, they're actually equivalent in some properties. Then there's other things like RAF, ZAB, and view stamp replication. View stamp replication actually came before Paxos and all these other ones. Uh, RAF, as it came out of Stanford, it's designed to be more understandable than Paxos, which is, is debatable. Um, but the ones we're going to focus on are these two here, right? Because again, most distributed databases are going, to, are going to implement either one of these or the combination of the two of them. So two-phase commit is exactly as it sounds. It has two phases, right? 
so say that we have our application server. It executed a transaction on these three nodes. And then it sends the commit request to its, its, the, the base partition, the base node here. So in the vernacular of two-phase commit, we would call the, the, the node that's going to be responsible for, for, for communicating with the other nodes to determine whether it's safe to commit a transaction as the coordinator. And then the other two nodes will just be called the participants. So the coordinator has to know somehow these other participants were involved in this transaction. So it knows it only sends the messages to those guys. Right? If it doesn't have this information, then it has to do a broadcast to every single node in our cluster. And, you know, and if we only talk, touch a subset of the machines, then most of the machines are going to say, I don't know, I've never heard of this transaction. I have nothing to do with it. Ignore me. Right? So somehow the, 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 the coordinator knows that it needs to talk to these two guys. So in the first phase, it's called the prepare phase. This is just a message to the, the nodes, the, the participants, and say, hey, this transaction wants to commit. Are you prepared to do that? Is that OK? And they can respond to either a yes or a no, or you know, a success or, or a abort. And in this example, we're going to assume the transaction is safe to commit. So they're going to come back now with OK right, after the prepare phase. But the, node, the coordinator node has to block and wait until it gets the uh, acknowledgment or the OK message from every participant in that transaction. Right? So if the first guy sends his and the second guy gets delayed, then we can't proceed into the next phase because we have to wait until we hear e back from everyone. This is an important distinction of two-phase commit versus Paxos. In two-phase commit, uh, every single node that's involved in the transaction has to agree to commit the transaction. In Paxos, we'll see in a second, you just need a majority. All right, so once we get back all the, prepare, the, the acknowledgement on our prepare messages, then we enter the next phase and we send a commit message. Same thing, all these guys say, all right, I said this was okay to commit, now I'm being told it's okay to commit, so let me go ahead and commit and send back an acknowledgement to the coordinator. Now at this point, the transaction is considered committed. And we can send now an acknowledgement back to our, the, the, the transaction, to the application server, so we successfully committed this transaction. So one additional thing I'm not showing here uh, I don't know whether the textbook covers this, but if you read textbooks on like, you know, two-phase commit protocols, what's happening is that for every single step along the way, for every single message we get and every single acknowledgement we send back, like so every request and response we have at every single node, we're actually logging this on disk. Because if we crash and come back, we, we want to know, all right, I, 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 I was involved in this transaction, I saw the commit message, and I told it was okay to commit. Did that actually happen? Right? What, what, what do I need to do? So you're writing out these commit messages and these prepare messages in your write-ahead log the same way you would with regular transactions. So let's look at an example of an abort. So again, application server says we want to commit. We send out a prepare request to everyone say, hey, is it okay to commit this transaction? But let's say this bottom guy here, for whatever reason, we don't know, we don't care, it says, no, we don't want to commit this transaction, we want to abort. As Soon as the coordinator gets one abort message from any participant in, in the transaction, it knows this transaction cannot commit. So it can send back immediately the abort, abort message to the application server, and then it sends out the, 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 the abort message in the second phase. So even if this guy up here, if he says, oh, it's OK for me to commit this, he can't actually commit until he sees the commit in the second phase, the commit message in the second phase. So he sees abort and says, all right, we're, we, we, even though I said I want to commit, we can't commit this. We're going to abort this transaction. Yes? Yes. So his question is, his statement is that, or his question is, I said that every single message that we send over the network has to be logged to disk. Upon recovery, would that be treated as a, a undo or a redo? It depends. It depends on what phase you were in. Right? So like going back here, if I... Uh, if I, if I got a success and say, here, I got the OK, but then before I, sorry, I, I got the commit request, but before I sent back my acknowledgement that this was OK, I crashed. So I'd come back and say, all right, well, I was involved with this transaction. The last message I saw was a phase commit. Therefore, I'm allowed to commit. I, I, should, I should make sure that thing was actually committed. So this, I mean, so this is you know, multiple round trips in order to commit a transaction, but we have to do this because 
we need to make sure that everyone agrees that this is the right thing to do before we, we're allowed to go ahead and do it. So there are some optimizations where you can sort of send back acknowledgement to maybe to the application server or start these this these these voting phases in two phase commit earlier than other than just when when we actually go ahead and say commit. So two phase commit is old. It's been around I think the late 1970s, early 1980s, and there's been a bunch of proposals along the way of uh, or papers to show how people actually implement this in practice. As I said, the textbook says you have to log everything and you're super careful about everything you do, but in practice nobody actually does that. So the two optimizations you can do are early prepare voting and early acknowledgement. So in the case of early prepare voting, it, the way it works is that if I know I'm, as I'm sending queries to a node, like a participant node, if I know I'm sending the last query I'm ever going to send to that particular node, I can piggyback a message and say, hey, this is the last query I'm going to send you, and also tell me whether this is OK to actually uh, commit this transaction. Like, it, what is your vote on to prepare? Right? So now we don't have to do a separate round trip for the prepare phase. We send our query request along with the, the prepare phase message. And then the, the node sends back the result of that query plus the, its response and the vote in the, in the two-phase commit phase. And that way, when I enter to the two-phase commit, I know I don't need to wait for a round trip to go from the participant to that particular node, because I already know whether it's gonna, that it's going to vote to commit or not. Another way to optimize things is that instead of actually waiting for all the nodes to commit the transaction at the end of the second phase, you actually can send back the acknowledgment to the application server at the end of the first phase. As long as everybody agrees to commit, everything's been logged to disk, so at that point that, that transaction is considered committed. And if I crash, I can always come back and, and put me back in the correct state. So that's the second optimization looks like this. Application server says I want to commit. We send out the first, the first voting phase and the prepare phase. All our participants come back and say, yes, this is OK. At this point here, if everything's durable in disk, then my transaction is considered committed. And that no matter what, I, I should see the effects or the changes of this transaction are durable in disk. So I don't need to wait for the second phase to complete before I tell the application server that this transaction is successfully committed. So this is, again, this is the, the early acknowledgement. Everyone agrees that we can commit this transaction. At this point here, the transaction is committed. So why wait for the second round? Let me just go back and tell you that you've already committed. I still have to do the second phase so that everyone knows that this thing's successfully committed. right? But the application server does, doesn't need to wait for that. Another advantage of this too also is that uh, thinking like on two-phase locking, at this point here, I can release all the locks from my transaction because I, I, I know I've, I'm going to be able to commit. So rather than waiting to the very end after, after the, the second phase, I can release everything right away. Yes? So a state, statement is, in this case here, I send back the success message early after the, after the prepare phase. How do I make sure now that the transaction is truly committed? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Right, so again, I've logged all these messages in my system. So if I crash and come back, I would look on the log and say, all right, well, everyone agreed that we should commit this transaction. Therefore, the transaction is committed. So now I just complete the process as I would going through the second phase. OK, so, so after failure, the node one will recover first and then just go to phase two and let all the other nodes commit, right? Yes. Okay. The statement is, after, if I fail at this point here, say, say the whole cluster goes down. We'll talk about how one node goes down in a second. If the whole cluster goes down. Then I come back, look at my log, and says, what, what was I doing at the moment of the crash? Oh, I was involved in the two-phase commit process for this transaction. And look, everyone said it was OK to commit this transaction. So now, let me go ahead and make sure everyone knows that we're going to go ahead and commit this transaction. And whether the recovery is being done through the coordinator globally or every node can come back up and figure out on its own what its correct state should be, we, we, we don't, we, we're not going to discuss that here. There's different ways to do both of them. Yes? Um, isn't it uh, more useful when the 
other uh, nodes are uh, replicated without the, rather than like uh, partitions. So he says, he, he brings up an excellent point. So he says, is this more, isn't this more useful when the nodes are replicated rather than there being partitions? Right? So again, I'm just drawing node here. I didn't say whether it was, it was a replication or a partition. Right? I'm being vague on purpose. So why do you think, rep, why do you think it would be better for partition versus replication? Uh, because if, if there are partitions, then, uh, then the, if the uh, data was not actually commit, then the uh, application still cannot access the data uh, on, on, on those partitions. But if there are replications, uh, then they can access the data from the nodes that was already committed. To the, uh, like the All right, so you said if, we're, if this is partition data, then if, if, if what? If this guy goes down, uh, what do you, what do you, what's, what's, what's the scenario you're saying? One node goes down? Uh, because because uh, in the phase one, you have uh, acknowledged the application that it is already commit. Then if the application now is uh, trying to assess the data on that partition, it will fail uh, because it's not actually committed. It, 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 uh, you don't know whether it's actually committed in that partition. Yeah, so, so his statement is, at this point here, uh, if someone tries to read data here, this guy knows it told, told this guy it wanted to commit, but it doesn't know whether it actually committed because it hasn't gotten this message yet. Yeah. Right. So, and his statement was, if it's replicated, then you could figure that out from looking at other nodes. If it's partitioned, you don't know that because you're only looking at your local thing. Yeah. That's right. So you, would ha you have to do some extra work to know that someone's trying to read data here. It's data from this transaction. I told it that it should commit. Didn't actually commit yet, because I haven't heard back whether it's committed. I could I either block and don't let you read it, or let you do a speculative read, and don't let, you, let that the second transaction commit until you get the final acknowledgment. So There's extra bookkeeping you have to do underneath the covers to avoid that. So it does not help like, uh, improve the accessibility? His statement is, it does not help you improve the accessibility or, or availability. Uh, his statement is, it does not help you improve the availability by doing this. This optimization is not for availability. This optimization is for to reduce the latency of, of sending back the acknowledgement. We still have to go through the full two-phase commit process. It's just, when do we tell the application server you're the committed or not? Yes? Her, her question is, is the second phase actually necessary? I think that uh, phase two commit from the coordinator is necessary, but is the vote, uh, not vote, the method of tracking that necessary? Oh, yeah. So her statement is, you need, to, you need phase two, right? But do you actually need to wait for this thing to come back? So, so, so the, uh, how do I say this? When you say who, you don't need to wait, so who's you? The coordinator or like the whole machine or the application? Huh? Right, so again, that's like the textbook definition of two phase commit. What I'm saying is you don't have to do this, right? If you do, the, if you do this, if you, like, like at this point here, it doesn't matter whether I send it out or I haven't sent it out. I can tell the application server I've committed. So you said the optimization. So if we get like a question saying two phase commit, are we going with the optimization definition or are we going with this like original definition? Are you saying like for the homework? Yeah. I I have to look what I put in the homework. I don't I don't remember. All right. I try to be very specific about like different parts. Okay. I will double check this. Okay, so as I said, we have to log all the messages as we go along. In my scenario here, I had, I had a node be able to say I aborted, but again, everything was always up. So now what happens if the coordinator crashes while we're running the transaction? Well, it depends on what phase we were in, but now it's up to, up to the participants to figure out, hey, we were involved in this transaction, the node we were talking to as our coordinator, he's gone, what the hell do we do, right? So you, what you could do is you could elect a new, uh, one of the participants comes to the new coordinator and reconcile things that way. 
In practice, what, what most, most systems actually do is the easiest one is just kill the transaction and say abort it. Right? Again, it depends on what phase you're in. What happens if one of the participant crashes? Again, same thing. The coordinator just assumes that this is this, if a, if a, a node crashing is equivalent to the node coming back or a node sending an abort message. And because we in two phase commit, we have to have all the transaction or all the nodes agree that it's okay to commit the transaction before we can commit the transaction. If one of them disappears, then we just abort the transaction outright. All right. All right. So as I said, two phase commit is as far as I know, this is the most this is the protocol that's most used in, in distributed databases. The other one you may be familiar with also is Paxos. Um, did they cover that in the, in, in the intro? Okay. Yes. So Paxos is a consensus protocol. Again, consensus protocols, what they call them in distributed computing literature. In databases, we call them atomic commit protocols, the same thing. So consensus, it's going to be a consensus protocol where we're going to have another coordinator send out a proposal that whether we want to commit a transaction or not, just like before. And then all the participants are going to vote whether it's allowed to commit a transaction. But unlike in, in two-phase commit, where we have to have everyone agree to commit a transaction, under Paxos, we only need a majority. And if someone disagrees and the uh, because they you know because they, they don't want to commit a transaction, but everyone else says they want to commit a transaction, then that node has to fix themselves and reconcile that issue and and correct themselves. Another way to think about this is if a node goes down um, and we still have enough enough information about, about the transaction, we don't have to abort the transaction. Right? Because we, we can still keep on running. So uh, Paxos is was invented by uh, Leslie Lamport. He's a re, re, you know, senior research fellow or whatever he is at, at Microsoft Research. Um, he won the Turing Award probably four or five years ago for this point. Um, so the paper that describes Paxos is this one here called the Part-Time Parliament. Um, it, it was originally written in 1992. Um, this, the way the story goes, according to Leslie Lamport and others, is that he, he submitted it and the uh, reviewers rejected it. And so he put it in his, you know, put it on the shelf or his, 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 in his desk for, and you know, forgot about it or just left it there because, because no one would understand and appreciate it. And then people started publishing papers that looked a lot like Paxos, uh, but they weren't quite solving the problem that he has solved. So then he finally said, oh, no, no, I actually have solved this problem already. Here's the paper I wrote five or six years ago. And it finally got published. If you read it, it's amazing, right? It's not written like a regular computer science paper. It's written as if it was a, from an archaeologist finding this, this ancient Greek tribe on an island called Paxos. And he talked about how the, 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 the government would actually do voting on these tablets by leaving them in a hole or whatever, and they come back later to figure out what's going on. So the issue was, he claimed, was that no one could understand the, or they wanted him to rewrite and remove all the, the archaeological story in the original paper, uh, and that's why it got rejected. The truth was, he didn't actually, he needed a proof at the end to actually explain it, what was actually going on, but he refused to do that. He refused to change any part of this paper, um, and then that's why he, he, he withdrew it from... From, from publication early on. So I've never met Lamport, uh, but I know the guy that actually reviewed this paper. And he, they have differing stories about what Leslie Lamport says happened and what actually really happened. OK, so for Paxos, uh, for now we're going to have in, in, our, in our transaction, we're going to actually have four nodes in, involved in this because again, we need a, a majority to vote to agree to commit a transaction. So just like before, the application server goes to the first node and says, I want to commit. In Paxos, instead of being a coordinator, they're going to call this a proposer. And then the other nodes are going to be called acceptors. Same concept, same idea. This guy goes out and says, hey, I'm going to propose to commit this transaction. Just, just, like, just like the prepare phase. And let's say this first guy, or the, the second guy here, he says, no, no, no I, I, I go down, or I crash, or I don't want to commit this transaction. Under two-phase commit, we'd have to stop everything right then and there. We have to abort this transaction and, and retry it. Under Paxos, though, as long as we get a, a majority of the nodes to, to agree that we want to commit this transaction, then the protocol is allowed to proceed to the second phase, where we, we now commit the transaction. Right? And the second guy has to come back later on and says, all right, I, I, I was either down or I didn't want to commit this transaction, but everyone overrule, overruled me. Let me go back and, and correct myself. So. Another way to, to sort of think about it is in terms of this timeline, right? And 
in my example here, it's, it's always been one node proposing to commit a transaction. But under the Paxos protocol, you can have multiple nodes trying to commit, commit transactions at the same time that may interfere with each other. And Paxos has a way of, of resolving this. So they basically have this logical counter that always is marching forward in time. So every time you want to propose to commit a transaction, you add one to this counter and say, I'm trying to commit this transaction at, at th this particular time. Right, so say we want to propose a commit transaction at, at time n. The acceptors say, yeah, that's OK. We're OK with agreeing to commit it at time n. But now if another, another node comes along and says, hey, I want to commit a transaction at n plus 1, then what will happen is when this, the first guy says, all right, everyone agreed to go to commit this. Let me go ahead and commit this now. They're going to come back and reject this and say, we can't commit n because we've seen n plus 1. We've seen a higher proposal for what to commit. And therefore, they come back and agree to commit this guy, and he can go ahead and commit. And then this other, the other uh, proposer has to come back later on and say, all right, well, this is either the same transaction, I'm going to try to commit it again, or I'm, I re-execute it, and now here's, here's new information about it. So this will make more sense in a second when we talk about replication uh, in, in a multi-master setup, where you could have transactions accessing the same data just on two different nodes, like two different copies of the same data, and they're both trying to commit, and now you need a way to, to reconcile that. Yes? Does Paxos apply to partitions? His question is, does Paxos apply to partitions? Absolutely, yes. So wouldn't that, like, forcing the minority to make a call of inconsistency in the database? So you said, wouldn't forcing, uh, sorry, forcing what to commit? The the statement is, it wouldn't forcing the minority to commit even though, oh, yeah, if the majority says I want to commit, one node says I don't want to commit, would that call, cause inconsistencies? Well, no, because again, there's, there's concurrent control being done on top of this. You have to make sure that you can only read things from, from committed transactions. Like, that all still applies from before. The, the guy that says I don't want to commit, then he gets overruled, it's his job now to go, go figure out how to put him in the correct state for committing this transaction. So the statement is, in the implementation of the database system, yeah. you have to write code that can recognize, oh, I did not want to commit, but I got overruled. We have to go ahead and commit this. Let me go reconcile that and fix myself up. Yes. So this is a good difference between what we're talking about here and like blockchain. OK? So in this environment, we're assuming all of our nodes are friendly, meaning like they, they're, we control them. They're running our database system software that we trust, and they're doing what we want them to do. So yes, I got overruled, but I'm not. I, I'm part of the you know the same distributed database. I'm here to help. So let me go ahead and correct myself. So, Block, so to say, blockchain is it is a distributed database where you don't trust the other nodes, and therefore you can't you you can't just assume that if if, if I say abort and you say commit, that we're both going to end up doing the right thing. So there's extra protection mechanisms you have to have to figure out, get everyone to vote that it's okay to go ahead and make that change. So what if this abortion is caused by a inconsistency? Your statement is, what if, what, if, what if the abort is caused by an inconsistency in this partition? Can you be more clear? So what if, like, why, why, why can you assume that a abortion is always going to be His, state, his question is, why can we assume that um, abort can always be, always be resolved? Just as a point in English, yes, abortion is the right thing to say, but people get upset about that. I don't, but like, you, you would say the abort, not the abortion. Cool. Okay. Um, <laughs> I mean, in what scenario would, would uh, an abort not be able to be resolved, right? Like, like, I, I, like going back here. Right? So say this guy aborts. Right? He gets overruled. So he now say, I, I, I'm missing a line. But say he gets the commit message. He says, I want to abort, but I, I got overruled. So let me go ahead and, and commit whatever I was going to do. Right? Oh, so you're, you're referring to something like, more like, how do I say this? Yeah, so the, I think the issue he's coming up with, and I think I talked talk about this last class, was during the, the, sort of the commit phase, 
we could be doing checks for integrity constraints about making sure that the, you know, and during, this, during the commit phase, we would check that integrity constraint, recognize that, oh, we would violate this, therefore we can't commit the transaction. So now if I go ahead and get overruled that I can't commit the transaction, then uh, it would put my node at, at an incorrect state, right? Um, so, that, so in that scenario, how do I say this? Yeah, so. I think that's not something that the commit protocol should be worried about. Uh, if, if you are going to commit a transaction, you need to, like, like uh, uh, for, for those, like, uh, like confliction, you, you should deal with it with in the, like, the proposal node. Uh, you have to make sure that your, node, your com transaction can be committed. Yeah, so, he, so he's right. So I'm, I, I think, I think I'm, I'm Blurring the lines between concurrent control and, and atomic commit protocol or consensus protocol. His statement is that before you propose that we want to commit this transaction, everyone everyone will sort of you would have found the violation earlier. Right? If I try to insert something that shouldn't have been inserted, at the moment I sent the query over to try to do that in, in, incorrect thing, then my I would have gotten abort. You wouldn't check it later on. There are global asserts defined in the standard where you can have them fired off on commit. But again, you, like, you, you don't want to do this. So if you, if you say, like, uh, before the proposal sends the prepare message, it already knows that every transaction on uh, other nodes is, is OK. It's OK to commit. Why do we need that? So his statement is, if I now I'm claiming that, um, if I'm claiming that, at the moment we, we, we start Paxos or two-phase commit to go to commit, I didn't violate anything, any integrity chain, because I caught them all before. Why do we still need Paxos? Or why do we still need a atomic commit protocol? Why do we also need like, two phases? This can be actually done in one phase. So his statement is we can do this in one phase. That's a, definitely that's not true. Uh, let's talk about replication, and we'll see in a second why, why this is the case. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can fail at every single step along the way, and you're just being super careful to make sure everyone agrees that this is the state we should be in. Okay. All right, so this example here, uh, this was an example, this is, this is as defined in, in original Paxos protocol, you can have multiple proses at the same time, and you're just always moving this logical clock forward, and you make sure that uh, if someone comes along with, with a newer proposal before you, you um, you roll back and, and, and don't commit your transaction. Yes? Uh, why should the acceptor reject the class one uh, after they see a class one? So his question is, why back here, when the acceptors, as soon as they see n plus one, now reject n? Yes, why should So I don't get the details of this. Think of this as like a log, right? The state of the database is just a log. We're just appending. Here's the changes we're making. So every, n, n plus 1, n plus 2, these are just the other entries in the log that say the state of our database is now n. The state database is now n plus 1, right? So the idea here of rejecting n because we've seen n plus 1 is, is to make sure that we don't end up in this weird state where some of the nodes think we're at n and some of the nodes think, think we're at n plus 1. Correct. Yeah, so his statement is, if I have multiple proposers, and this is actually in the next slide, if I have multiple proposers all proposing, commit this, commit this, commit this, and they're essentially clobbering each other, I could end up uh, starved because nothing ever gets done, right? So the solution to this is called multi paxos and basically you have a leader election to pick one node to always be the proposer, and, for, and you give it a lease and say, you can be the, 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 the proposer for a minute or so, and it's the one that's always allowed to propose stuff. So now you don't have this issue of like another guy proposing at the same time you are. You know all proposals have to go through through this one node, right? 
So that, that sort of solves that problem. And then every so often, if you have a failure, you just run regular Paxos to now elect the new leader. Yes? So the question is, is there a reason why the new proposal always wins versus the, the, the older one? Um, which is sort of what he was asking, like, wh like why not just have them, why always have to reject, reject them right away as soon as you see a newer one? I think it's, a, it's a, the idea is the same thing we talked about with like, like latches. If you always go in one direction, you don't worry about things coming in different directions and screw you up. Her statement is, what if I always let the older one live, uh, win? So actually, I don't know the answer to that. Right? That may work. I don't know. I think the older proposal might abort, so it might crash, and then it will refuse that the older wing, and the unsecretary will don't know what to do. His statement is, uh, oh, that, yeah, that's, that's true, yes. Yeah, that's right. So his statement is that if you always accept the older one, going back here, if, I, if I'm here, and I, instead of rejecting n, I allow this to happen, or sorry, I'm, I'm here. I see n plus 1. Now this proposal that proposed n, he crashes. And n plus 1 would get rejected. But these guys, it's going to take a while for these guys to figure out that this one, this one crashed. You can have a timeout and say, if I don't hear back from you from you know, 10 seconds, then, you, then I've aborted. But it just sort of adds complexity to this. OK. So again, the, the, the many systems that run on the, uh, the older distributed databases usually use two-phase commit. Or, um, the newer NoSQL guys and some of the, the, the newer distributed databases use Paxos or Raft or some variant of it. Um, and again, the key distinction in two-phase commit, again, we have to, we have to, if the coordinator fails, we have to block until we figure out what, what the hell was going on. Um, in Paxos, we can be non-blocking as long as we have a majority agree that this is, that this is the, 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 the change we want to make to our database. Okay? All right, moving along. So replication. So this is probably what you're going to encounter the most in, uh, in a distributed database. Um, again, whether you would call it distributed, you know, if you take MySQL or Postgres and you replicate it onto another machine, is that still considered distributed database? All right. In my case, yes. Uh, I would say yes. Um, but, you know, it's, it's not the sort of shared nothing partition distributed database most people think of. So the idea with, with replication is that we're going to have, make redundant copies of objects on different nodes to now increase availability. And the goal here is, again, if, if one node goes down, then we have another one that, that, can, that can, or other ones available that can still continue to serve requests. The tricky thing is going to be, what, how do we actually maintain, how do we keep these replicas in sync? And how do we make sure, uh, how do we actually propagate changes between them? So there's a bunch of design decisions we have to discuss uh, as we go along and if how we actually can build a, a replicated database. And this will be in, in either in a partition system or a non-partition system. So I'm being vague about what we're replicating here. I'm just saying object. It could be a tuple, it could be a table, it could be a, a partition. It doesn't matter. All these things we're talking about here are still, uh, are still germane. And this is another area in databases where the, the, the language is very, um, there's, it's, it's not standardized. Some things it is, other things, other systems call, you know, uh, different replication schemes, different things, and but we try to let's try to distill what they actually are. All right, so the first design cho choice we have to make is how are we actually going to configure our system with replicas? So the two approaches to do master replica or ma multi master. So master replica is sometimes called leader follower. Uh, traditionally, it was called master slave, but people don't refer to that anymore. Right? The idea here is that all the updates for an object are going to go to a single master node. And then that master node is responsible for then propagating those changes to its replicas. So it has to know what, where, where its replicas are. If we have any, uh, any read-only transactions, depending on how we configure the system, they could go 
read on the replicas. We can offload the read requests to the replicas, but all the write requests always have to go to the master. And then what happen is if the, if the master node goes down, then we run Paxos to do a leader election, like propose, you know, propose that this replica is now the new master. If everyone agrees, then we get uh, promoted as the new master. Multi-master is where we have the object replicated in different locations, and transactions can update them in any, any one location. Right? And then underneath the covers, the replicas are, are responsible for synchronizing the changes with, with each other as needed. So let's look at these visually. So in the first one, we get master replica. We have one partition P1. It's on the master, and it's replicated on the two replicas. All our reads and writes, uh, all writes with some reads go to the master node. And then in the background, it goes ahead and propagates the updates to the replicas. And if I have a read-only transaction, and I'm OK with possibly reading the stale data, depending on how I, I do this replication, I can have the read-only transactions go to the replicas. And again, you want to do this because now you're using the master node only to absorb the writes, which are expensive to do. And your, your, your reads can be offloaded to these other machines here. Under multi-master, I have a single partition. It's replicated on, on the two nodes. And any read-write transaction can go to any node. And we have to use two-phase commit or, 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 or whatever consensus protocol we want to use underneath the covers to keep these two guys in sync. All right, this clear. So, so master slave or master replica is probably the most common setup you will see out there. Right? If you're running Postgres, unless you're using like Citus DB or one of the ones that makes it make it a shared nothing system, most Postgres installations are going to be or MySQL installations are, are going to be like this. You have one machine as the master, and then you have a hot standby for your replicas. If the master goes down, then you can promote the the one of the replicas to be the new master. Another concept we have to have consider now in a replicated database environment is this idea of case safety. So I don't know, again, I don't know if this is, this is part of the industry standard. This is what Mike Stonebreaker used for, for Vertica and VoltDB and his other systems. But case safety is, is the idea that at some threshold we're going to set in our system to determine how tolerant we are to failures in, in the distributed database. So K is going to be the number of nodes that has to be available before we take the system offline because we have so many failures. So going back here, say my case safety is, 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 is two for this setup here. So I have three copies of, of, of the partition, right? One master, two replicas. So if, say, the, if the, one of these nodes goes down with case safety two, I can keep on running because I have two copies of the data available. But if a, if a, a second node goes down, then the system will say, I don't have two copies of this data. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to halt all execution until that gets resolved. And the idea here is you're trying to be overly careful about making sure that you never end up losing data. Because what you don't want to happen is, right, it, with K52, I, I do it right here, and the writes get propagated here. If this node goes down, then I still have two copies every write at these two locations. But if both copies go down, then I could do writes here. I tell the outside world my transaction committed, but then this machine catches on fire and melts, right? And now I come back and, and, and bring the database back on these two replicas. And now whatever, whatever writes I did on this thing that didn't get propagated to these guys is now gone forever because the machine melted, right? So KTAT is, is, is an extra protection mechanism that you can set in the system to say, keep running until, until I don't have at least two copies or one copy or whatever you want, OK? So now we need to talk about how we're actually going to propagate these changes between replicas. So an easy way to think about this, uh, it's not, not the only way you can do this, but the easiest way to think about this is you're just streaming out the write-ahead log contents to the other machine. Right? Sometimes they're called the bin log, sometimes they're called the op log. Different database systems call them different things, but the, it's, it's basically the same idea. All the log records you're, you're, you're generating as you apply changes to the database on one machine, you stream them out to another machine and then it applies them as if, it's, if, as if it's in recovery mode. The question, though, is how, how long do we have to wait, or, or what do we need to wait for before we tell the outside world that your transaction is safely, is safely committed and replicated with our case safety factor? So the three choices are synchronous, asynchronous, or semi-synchronous. 
So this is now where you start to get into the, 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 the realm of what, what makes NoSQL systems different than sort of traditional, you know, transactional distributed databases. So synchronous is where the, in a, say you're doing a master replica setup, where the, the master is going to send updates to its replicas, and it has to wait until those replicas acknowledge and commit those changes and write them out the disk before it sends back the acknowledgement to the application server. So say I have a master and a replica. The application server says we want to commit. We send a, 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 a commit flush request to the, uh, to the replica. Think of this as like in being part of two-phase commit. I have to wait now until this guy says, OK, I've go ahead, I've, I've actually flushed it. So this guy will flush everything to disk, send back the acknowledgment, and then we can send back the acknowledgment to the, to the, the application server. And the reason why we do this is because if at this point here, if we crash, this node crashes, we don't know whether this node actually saw those changes yet. So technically, our transaction has not committed yet. So we don't want to tell the outside world we've committed and then come back and try to read it, and, we're not, and we can't see any of our changes. Asynchronous is when you don't wait at all. So I want to go ahead and commit on this node here. I say, hey, go ahead and flush to my replica, but I don't wait for anything. I don't care if it even got the message. I immediately send back an acknowledgment to the application server and say, your, your transaction committed. It's, it's durable. And then at some later point, this, this guy will end up flushing. So this is what NoSQL systems use in many cases. And this is what eventual consistency means. Right? It means I can apply a change to my master node, and then the replicas will eventually get it. Right? There's been studies to say how long it actually takes to get this, depending on what the network looks like and how far away it is. It's roughly maybe like 50 milliseconds in some systems. But now there's a 50 second window, 50 millisecond window, where I could do a read here, and I don't see something that I thought committed, I committed here. Right? I'm seeing inconsistent data. I'm seeing incorrect data. A third approach is called semi-synchronous, and as far as I know, I, I mean, I, I know this is used in MySQL, and this is what MySQL calls it. I don't know if this is available in other systems. But the idea here is, rather than waiting for the, the replica node to flush everything to disk, as long as it gets the, I get an acknowledgement that they received my messages to, to commit this transaction, then that's good enough for me. So I go ahead and want to commit. I send a flush request to the, my replica. The replica immediately comes back, or I have to wait until the, until the replica comes back and says, I've, I've received your flush request. I will eventually do this. So then, as soon as you get back that acknowledgment, then you send the acknowledgment back to the application server. At some later point, it would actually end up flushing things. Now it's actually durable. So now if the master crashes, the, the, you, we know our data would actually be there. So this is sort of trying to be the, trying to, the, the bridge the gap between synchronous and asynchronous. Right, so that's what semi-synchronous means. It's saying basically, my message made it over there. I know it has it. It's in memory, but it's not durable to disk yet. And I'm I'm going to make a trade-off that I'm going to assume that my that this node is actually not going to go down from the time it actually takes to you know to flush it out the disk. So maybe depending on the speed of your disk, maybe 50 to or sorry, five to 10 milliseconds before that happens. So I'm allowing myself to have a 10 10 millisecond window where. I told the outside world my transaction committed, but it actually didn't get replicated yet. So this is, this is an important concept that you have in distributed databases where the design of the system, uh, or to how you configure the system, could affect what correctness or, uh, or, or durability guarantees you, you could actually have in the system. And you make these, these trade-offs between not having things fully replicated and committed everywhere in order to get better performance. Yes? Uh, what is the relationship between the propagation scheme and two-phase committing or hack? So his question is, what is, what is the, um, what is the uh, uh, how do I say this? What is the relationship between Paxos and this replication scheme? So in, um, in this case here, say there's a master, master replica. So the, so the master is the one that has to decide whether I want to commit this or not. So it doesn't need to coordinate to this guy and say, can I commit this? It's going to tell him, commit this. Right? 
in, if I was doing a multi-master setup, then I need to do coordination across the two of them, right? And use atomic commit protocol to, to reconcile that cha those changes, right? I should be more clear. This is master replica, right? But the, the concept can still apply in a multi-master setup where I just don't wait for things to actually, you know, get committed. The main point I'm trying to point out here is if I, if I sacrifice durability and correctness, I can get better performance. And this is what the NoSQL guys uh, decided to go, go with. In addition to giving up the relational model and joins and SQL and other things. But this is at the end, uh, this is the, one of the core things about, about them. Yes? Or even the worst case, the semi-synchronous approach can be as bad as asynchronous. Yeah, so his statement is, in the worst case scenario, semi-synchronous can be as, just as bad as asynchronous. Yes, right, because if I'm here, I got the acknowledgement that, that it received the message, but it didn't actually flush it yet, I don't know, and I tell the outside world I, I, this thing committed, this thing could, could, this could crash, this could crash, and I come back and it's not there, right? But the idea is that the, 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 the window is much smaller than asynchronous, in theory. Because it's in memory, the likelihood that's going to crash is actually very low, but it's, it's a 5 mil, 10 mil, millisecond window where I could be vulnerable. And again, people make this trade-off to, to give up some of those protections in exchange for performance. We saw the same thing with concurrency control when we talked about isolation levels. If I run with the serializable isolation level, it's, you know, I'm, I'm running with the, the highest guarantees that everything's running as if it's, it's isolated, and I don't see the effects of other transactions. If I relax those, the isolation level and go to a lower isolation level, I'm going to get better performance because I have more interleaving opportunities, but I'm, I could be exposed to anomalies and, and, and sacrifice correctness. So again, it's, it's like this, this, this uh, tug of war between performance and correctness. And most systems, most people probably don't need full protection of things, so something like semi-synchronous might be just good enough. Okay. The last thing, or the last two things I want to talk about are the timing of when we propagate updates and the, of where we're generating the, 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 the messages or where we're generating the changes for the database. So this, is, this one's pretty simple, for propagation timing. When do we actually tell the replica, here's our changes for our transaction? So continuous is almost exactly what everyone does, where as the, the transaction makes changes on the master node, or whatever it's base partition or base, base node, the, as it generates those log records, in addition to writing them out to disk on the right ahead log on my, on my node, I'll also send those over the network to my replicas. I'm continually creating those log records. The other approach is do on commit, and this is where I just buffer all my log messages at my machine, at, at the master node, but only when I find out my transaction is going to commit, then I, I actually send them over. Right? You would think this is kind of stupid, but the advantage is that uh, you're not, you end up sending less messages if you have a lot of transactions that, that a lot of transactions that, that could abort. Because you don't, you know at the end of the transaction, I, I'm not going to commit, so therefore you don't, you're not wasting messages to send it over. And you're sort of, and you're guaranteeing that the, the, the replicas never see any, any, any changes from transactions that don't commit, so recovery is, is way easier. Because you only have to do redo, you never, never have to undo. But in practice, as far as you know, Everyone always does the first one. The last one is, I don't know what actually to call this, but it's, 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 it's where, the, uh, where the transaction is running and where it's generating changes that, ne that ne need to be propagated to replicas. So this is where people call this different things in different systems. So the two choices are active-active versus active-passive. So the way I was taught, my understanding in the context of VoltDB and HStore, Active active is where you can have transactions that the same transaction can run independently on different replicas. So say I have a transaction that wants to update the counter, I uh, you know add one to some some tuple. Active active would have that query run at both locations of the replica, and then they just need to do two phase commit or whatever they need to do depending on what commercial protocol I'm using to make sure that they're they're in sync. Active passive is where you have them the transaction runs at one replica site, it applies the change, and then generates the log record that it then ships over to the other location, who then applies that change. 
So this is not the same thing as master replica versus, versus multi-master, because you can have both of these scenarios in a, in a multi-master database or a multi-replica database. So VoltDB is a uh, VoltDB is a master replica database, and they support Active Active. But other systems can do Active Active uh, in a in a in a in a in a multi-home or multi-master database. So hopefully they'll come next week and they'll explain this, make it more clear. All right. So any questions about replication? Yes. You want to go back to Paxos? Which, which, which question about, about Paxos? So, like, is the Paxos is applied to partitions? And when you're executing a transaction that happens on multiple partitions, so on one partition it fails, would that go to the Paxos phase? Like, or even go to the prepare phase? So I, have, I want to get through the last bit of the slides. Let's talk about this out afterwards, OK? OK. All right. So real quickly, who here has heard of the CAT theorem? Mm, less than fifty percent. Okay, good. All right. So the CAT theorem is a way to understand about these trade-offs we just talked about in a distributed database of what what problems is is uh, what what issues you can have in a distributed environment. Are you gonna, are you going to allow your database to be resilient to? So it was proposed by a Berkeley professor named Eric Brewer. This is an old picture with his mustache. It's insane. Like He looks like a 50-year-old man with his mustache. I've met him in real life, and he doesn't have the mustache, and now he looks like 25, right? Um, <laughs> he's super nice. All right, so he proposed this, in this as a conjecture in the, I think the late 1990s, early 2000s, um, and then it's been since proved uh, rigorously um, with theory that this is actually correct. So he says that if you're going to have a distributed database system or distributed system in general, uh, it's impossible to have to be both consistent, always available, and network partition tolerant. And I'll explain what that is as we go along. Right. So he basically says you can pick two out of the three, and it's sort of it's hand wavy because this is not always exactly true. It's always you get two, but like what these things mean in different environments can can change. So the way I think about this is you have this this, this Venn diagram. C corresponds to linearizability, so this would be, uh, I'll go through an example, like that the database is always going to be correct as I apply changes. Availability means that I'm always going to be up no matter how many nodes actually go down. And then partition tolerance means that I can still execute transactions or execute operations and have my database be online, even though uh, the network may be severed and I'm losing messages. All right, and the middle part here is, is no go. Like no system can actually be all three of these. You may sometimes see uh, posts from people to say that, oh, I, I defeated the cat theorem. People don't do this anymore. But it happened for a while. Um, the 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 new DB guy, for example, Jim Starkey. If you, there's some Google group posting where he says new DB defeats the cat theorem, and everyone pummeled him, right? Um, so this is proven to be correct. Like you have to make make this trade off in here. So let's go through all the examples. So the first one has to do with consistency. So the idea is that if I have a transaction and say it's running on this application server here, and I want to set A equals 2, I apply my change. Um, and now I need to propagate that change to my other replica. And that way, if uh, you know, using the replication schemes we talked about, once I know that's done, I can send back the acknowledgment and say that my transaction uh, has successfully committed, and it's, it's copied everywhere. So now, if another transaction running on another node comes along and reads A, if I told the outside world that my transaction committed and I'm making sure that I'm doing replication and everything's consistent, then I'm guaranteed to see the correct value of A here. All right, so this, this is the property you, would, you want to guarantee in your database system. All right? So again, if I tell one transaction that it's committed and it's replicated, then anybody that tries to read my change will see it. Availability means that if the uh, if a node goes down, then no matter what, I can still propagate or still still execute transactions. So say this node goes down here, I can read B, I can and get a value, I can do writes on, and get a value, and uh, the other application server knows that this can't go to here, it'll go to this other one, and they can read A correctly as well. Right? So so we're guaranteeing that no matter how many nodes go down, the entire database is still available. Right? 
if say say we were doing partitioned, and this thing had partition you know two, and this had partition one, these are the only copies that I have. If this guy goes down, then I have to halt the database because I don't want people to see they'll have false negatives if they try to read data on partition B, but it's not available and it's not there. So in this case here, we have to shut everything down uh, if we're partitioned and not replicated. In this environment, the database is replicated at both locations, so I still have a copy here that this guy can read from, so I'm still available. Right? The last property is partition tolerance. So the easiest way to think about this is that the network goes down. That these two, these two nodes cannot communicate with each other. It doesn't have to be the network goes down. Right? This can also occur if, you're, if, you're, if your system is based on the, you know, built on, written in Java or uses the JVM. The, gar the, the, the JVM's garbage collector could have a long pause because you have a huge heap and it's going to look like your node's down, the network's down. It's just, it's not responsive because it's doing garbage collection. Right? So it doesn't have to be the network is actually severed. It could be other pauses in, in, in the stack. So at this point here, the, the, the network has gone down, so these two guys can't communicate with each other. What's going to happen? Well, it's a master replica setup. So as I said before, the replica is going to recognize, hey, I don't have a master anymore. I can't communicate with him. Let me run Paxos, and now I'm the new master. right? So now each, each node is going to think that it's the master of this, this replicated database. And what's going to happen is, this guy, each of these two application servers are going to send, start writing transactions. They're going to both update both of them, make di different changes, right? That are conflict. They both get an acknowledgement that these changes are allowed to happen. But now the network comes back, and now I have to resolve this. Where this guy thought it was the master, and he made a equals two. But this guy thought he was the master. And now it's a equals three. And I told both of the application servers that these these, this, these transactions are allowed to commit. So this, obviously, we, we don't want this to happen. So this is what I'm saying. You have to, in, in the cap theorem, at a high level, you have to pick two out of three. Because if I want to be network partition tolerant, then I can't be consistent. Because this is not consistent. A equals two, A equals three. I have a split brain. If I want to be available, then I can't be consistent in this case here because I can't communicate with these guys but they're both going to be able to write to the same thing. OK, so in general, how the data, a data management system or distributed data system handles these failures will determine what aspects or elements of the CAP theorem they're going to support. And traditional relational transactional or these, these the new class of systems called new SQL systems uh, that I, was, I helped build when I was in grad school, these are considered being uh, uh, consistent and, 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 and partition tolerant. Sorry, consistent and available. Meaning if they, if they connect, communicate with, with, with each other, and because there's, there's a network partition, then they stop being available. Because they don't want to end up with this, that split brain environment. A lot of NoSQL systems have mechanisms in place to actually handle all those cases. Or handle the case where I can have nodes go down, I can still be available. And they do this in, in exchange for sacrificing consistency. They have other mechanisms to figure out, like, all right, well, I don't care if I lose some rights, or I, just, I have the list of all the rights I've ever done. And they, have, they push upon the application server to figure out how to reconcile the changes to put the database back in the correct state. So going back here, like we have A equals 2, A equals 3. I come back online, the data system will recognize that these guys are, in, are not in sync with each other. And then we would send a message to the application server and say, hey, something bad happened. Figure out how to correct us. So some systems push that onto, onto you as the application writer. All right. So in the last 10 minutes, I want to talk about federated databases. But, but real quickly, is there any questions about this cap theorem stuff? OK. So up until this point, we, when we talk about distributed databases, we've been assuming that all the nodes in our database are part of the same software thing, software package, or whatever you want to call it, right? I have a distributed, distributed MySQL. Every single node in my, in, my my, in my cluster is a MySQL node. And there's some, you know, some framework or some middleware mechanism that knows that it's communicating with MySQL and knows how to send queries and to, you know, to, to the different MySQL machines. Or if I'm doing replication, I can have a MySQL node replicate to another MySQL node. And they, they natively support that. 
But in a lot of major organizations, and I'm sure you guys have seen this when you go off and do internships, they're not a one shop, you know, one database shop, right? They have a ton of different crap. They have you know, MySQL, they have Postgres, they have Mongo, they have Oracle, right? And what is often people want is they want the ability to have now a single interface that can read data from all of these different disparate database management systems. So I don't have to say, all right, well, I know my, 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 uh, my human resources data is, is in MongoDB over here, and then my stock ticker data is over here in Oracle, and I have to write an application server to go get the data that I need and put it back to, you know, put it all together. What I really want is a single database interface that can make it look as if it's a single logical database, even though underneath the covers, it's different, different software vendors. So this is what a federated database is. So a federated database is a distributed architecture where you can pull together or tie together a bunch of different, different database systems that could be from different software vendors. And then to the outside world, to the application server, it looks like you have a single database that encompasses all the data that's available to you. Right? And then you have right now, you can have a single query interface using SQL as an example. I can write a single SQL query that underneath the covers knows how to go read data from, 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 from XML data sources or from Amazon data sources or whatever. And I don't have to worry about how to, to access these different machines and put queries in the right semantics that these systems want. I have a single interface that does it all for me. Right? This sounds amazing. This would be like the holy grail of databases. Uh, in practice, though, nobody actually does this, or very few things actually do this, because it's hard, because not only are these systems going to have different languages, like Mongo doesn't support SQL, right? They have their own JSON thing, right? Other systems have their own proprietary stuff, or the different, 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 even the different relational databases that support SQL have different dialects of SQL, and they don't always match up. So getting all that, just getting all that query interface to be correct is hard. But now, if you want a way to like do query optimization, like predicate pushdown, joins, and other things, that's almost impossible to do in these environments because all these database systems assume that they're they're the master of the universe. They don't know and don't care about other database systems, so they only know how to do query optimization or do do execution for the queries that, that touch their data. But now you need to do something above all this to tie it all together. The other, so the other issue that ends up happening is that you see a lot of data copying. Like if I want to do a join between MySQL data and, 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 and HDFS or HBase data, i got to copy it out into, from data from one machine to another, or one system to another, and then do the join. Right? I can't natively do a join across all of that. So federated data sets are an old idea. They go back to the 1980s. Uh, there, are some software, there is some software available out uh, that do a subset of this. But they're not that common. Right? Most people just deal sort of one-off solutions to, to do these things. So to give a really quick example, uh, say you have some kind of middleware, our federated database middleware, and then in our back end we have MySQL, MongoDB, Redis, and PumpkinDB, uh, which is a real system. So again, we write a one query to our middleware, and the middleware says, oh, I know you need to test data at all these four systems. And it would say, all right, it has its own catalog and says, this table here is in Mongo, this table here is in MySQL. So it knows how to take the query that you sent it, break it apart into subqueries that can then send out to, uh, to, the, to the different database backends. So this process here, uh, this mechanism to go to get data from these different systems, these are usually called connectors. All right? It's usually how they're marketed for in, in enterprise scenarios. And then Depending on what the query is, if it's like a join, we ha may have to copy a bunch of data from the back ends and put it to the middleware and then do the join in the middleware. Or if, if we're really intelligent about it, we could have, all right, well, we take the data out of Pumpkin, put it directly into MySQL, and then have, do the join in MySQL, right? This all depends on how the federated database layer is actually implemented. And I'm, and I'm telling you, nobody, nobody does this well, right? Most systems have to copy everything to some central location and then apply the change. So uh, there are commercial products that do this. The, the one system that I think actually does, uh, that is actually probably the, the, the getting the closest to this, is actually Postgres. Postgres has, has a feature called Foreign Data Wrapper. So it's been around for a couple of years now. But the idea is that you can implement this Foreign Data Wrapper API 
and have that communicate with whatever, whatever backend database source you want. The other thing to do is like, it doesn't, this, these don't have to be full-fledged data, database systems. They could just be a bunch of XML files you have in a directory or data you have on S3 and Amazon, right? So these connectors essentially can, can know how to read this data and shove it into something else, right? So I'm not saying Postgres is the only one that does this. A lot of systems provide a connector API to go ahead and do this. But again, it's always treated almost as like a black box where you can't actually, uh, you know, you can't actually run complex queries on it. You have to always have to pull data up. Okay. So I guarantee that you're going to come across, and if you go work at big enterprises, you will people will, will, will complain about how all these different disparate databases. Sometimes these are called data silos because it's sort of sil all the data you need is siloed in, in one particular system. And ideally, they want a middleware layer to go ahead and pull everything up and make it look be, look be uniform. But there's no there's no magic bullet or, or magic oracle that'll do this. Okay. All right. So the main takeaways of this: uh, we talked about how to do commit protocols. We talked about how to do replication. And again, the lines are blurred of what actually uh, of how these two things fit together. Um, and depending on how you're actually doing replication, will determine at what stage you do Paxos or what stage you do two base commit. And then the last one I wanted to bring up, which, what I said to him earlier, is that in this entire lecture, last lecture and this lecture, and actually the next le le lecture next class, we assume that we're, we're, our, our distributed database is running in a friendly environment. And what I mean by that is the nodes are under our control, they're running our software, and we don't think they're going to do intentionally do something malicious or adversarial. I mean, if we say we want to go ahead and commit a transaction on one node, that node's not going to lie to us and say, yeah, fuck you, we're not going to do it, right? It'll do it because we control it, right? Contrast this with the blockchain, like in Bitcoin, right? It's, it's, it's you running, you know, you're running the, the Bitcoin protocol on your node. You're running the Bitcoin protocol on, 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 on my node, right? Like, I don't trust you. You don't trust me. So in order to commit transactions, there's a bunch of extra stuff we have to do to make sure to prove that we're actually allowed to commit this transaction. And hashing the way you know Bitcoin does this in a proof of work is one example of this. And then you have to do essentially a, a variant of a um, something like Paxos that's Byzantine fault tolerant to make sure that everyone agrees that we go ahead and commit this transaction. And I prove to you that I, I I did the work that I need to commit this transaction. So once everyone once a majority agrees, then it go ahead and commit. So that so all that extra work you have to do slows down the entire process, and that's why you look and see. Uh, like the in the case of the Bitcoin blockchain, I think they're doing like one transaction a second, right? In a real system, you know, if you're running a website, you couldn't actually do that, right? Because they have to do this extra stuff because they don't trust you when you say you're going to commit something, whether you're actually really going to commit it. In our environment, we don't worry about that because we control the hardware, at, at least at the level we care about, and we control the software. Okay. So that's all you hear from me about blockchain and Bitcoin this entire, this entire semester. It's just a transactional database where you don't trust the other people. Okay? All right. Next class, distributed OLAP systems. Again, how to do analytics in a distributed environment. Okay? All right, guys. See you on Wednesday. <laughs> that's my favorite all <laughs> What is it? Yes. It's the SD Cricket IDES. I make a mess unless I can do it like a Geo. Ice Cube with the G to the E to the T. Now here it comes, dude. I play the game where there's no rules. The homies on the cuff say I'm a fool cause I drink root. Put the bus a cap on the eyes, bro. Bushwick on the go with a blow to the eyes. Here I come. Willie D, that's me. Rolling with Fifth Watt, South Park, and South Central G. And St. Eyes when I party. By the 12 pack case of a four. Six pack 48 gets the real pop. I drink fruit, but yo, I drink it by the 12 ounce. They say beer makes you fat. But St. Eyes is straight, so it really don't matter. <laughs>